Well, hello, friends and colleagues. Thank you for joining us for the third Data Salon series with the Atlantic Council Geotech Center and Accenture. Uh, we're really glad that you're able to join us for this conversation that's meant to be interactive. And today we're going to be having a conversation about how do we address some of the gaps associated with coordinating data privacy and the public interest. A very timely conversation, obviously, because we're amidst everything that's happening with the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. But even beyond that, there are obviously issues where there is a strong public interest. There's also an individual interest in data privacy. And what can we do to actually ideally work towards win-wins in both cases? Uh, with that, I'd like to turn to Stephen, uh, my co-host and uh, with Accenture, and thank both first Accenture for sponsoring the series and two, uh, for all the efforts that Accenture is doing to foster conversations about data inclusion, diversity, and what we can do for a better world. Uh, Stephen, with you, you can take it over. Thank you, Dr. Bray. And I'm, I'm so pleased to uh, be here and, and be amongst uh, friends and peers as we have, uh, you know, another uh, meeting in the series of what will, uh, you know, hopefully be a, a long term, um, you know, set of engagements for the data salon uh, here at the Geotech Center at the Atlantic Council. Um, <clears throat> I also want to take a moment to read a, an inclusion and diversity statement um, because we are we are dedicated to inclusion and diversity and ensuring that everyone we work with feels that way and that they belong. And we do not tolerate racism, misogyny, misinformation, exclusion, or any other form of hate, and we refuse to let our work be a platform for these views. Uh, if you express these views, we may ask you to leave, and we have these views because it makes us and our work better and because it's the right thing for us to do. We have a community of peers here who we respect and who we trust, and we look to all of you to hold us accountable and share advice, whether we solicit it or not. And we want to do this and, and be the best we can, and in that spirit, if any of you wish to share your thoughts, feelings, opinions, please feel encouraged to reach out. If you have topics or themes, speakers that you uh, would like to see highlighted, especially ones that could improve our inclusion and diversity efforts, please let us know and we'll be happy to uh, look at how to get them on the agenda. Um, and with that, um, I'm excited to introduce uh, our, our um, speakers today. So we have Krista Pauly and Divya Chander. Um, we'll have a, a bit of a provocative conversation, hopefully, on data um, and its relationship to how we all feel about privacy. Um, and maybe I could ask each of them to, to give a brief introduction of themselves, and uh, Dr. Bray will be uh, moderating today's events. Thank you. So Divya, would you like to go first? A little bit about your background. Um, I know you just came from uh, the operating room, so uh, that, that I think is probably a, a claim to fame here at the Atlantic Council, but a little bit about what you're doing and, and then what are your thoughts about uh, some of the gaps with data privacy and the public interest? Well, thank you, David, and uh, thank you, Stephen, for actually welcoming us uh, to your data salon. Uh, so I live my life as both a physician and anesthesiologist uh, and a neuroscientist. Uh, as an anesthesiologist, I stick my face in people's mouths in order to put breathing tubes in. And so I get exposed to quite a lot of weird covid -y sort of aerosolized stuff in the environment. Uh, that's what I've been doing for the past couple of days. Uh, but my, my life as a physician data scientist um, taught me something very interesting. And that is uh, that it doesn't matter how much data you collect, it's really difficult to act upon that data. And some of the barriers to acting upon data include everything from how badly it's labeled, how much noise is in that data, um, how, how there's such a lack of interoperability so that it's very difficult for me to call up a colleague and share data sets simply because I might have labeled heart rate as HR and they may have used the word pulse. Uh, and finally, because of data privacy standards, uh, it's difficult to learn and uh, create data insights about things when you can't easily link it to people. People's genders matter, their age matters, their ethnicity matters because it changes their genomes and their epigenetics. Uh, and so there's any number of things. And none of this has been so deeply highlighted as you mentioned, David, during this COVID crisis, right? So um, public health officials, and I've served on three COVID task forces, public health officials are having a lot of difficulty, uh, especially in certain countries, 
making sense of COVID and where the hot spots are. And it's partially because we as a society um, are, we have this idea that our data should be private. But what's really interesting is that in healthcare, your data is far more private than it is when you go and post to Facebook or Google. And because of the privacy standards that the healthcare industry has tried to put into place, it makes it very difficult for public health officials to do things like move resources. So we can't predict hot spots. We have to wait till they happen. How do you move physicians and ICU beds and ventilators to the places that they're needed? Uh, and so I want to um, ask the group as we're, we're together in discussion, uh, where would you draw the line? How much is your own personal data worth to you? How much should you contribute it to the sake of the public good? Uh, and then I'd like to even start talking about novel technologies whereby you can have your cake and eat it too. Is there a way that you can actually protect your, your data, your privacy, hold on to your data, have ownership of it, but still contribute it for the public good? Uh, and finally, I'd like to throw out there, um, how is it that we can also authenticate data? It's important in healthcare, but it's also important in generally in dealing with fake news. Uh, and I give as an example, a viral video that was passed around from doctors from some organization who were basically quoting once again, perhaps studies for drugs that might be treating COVID but may really have no effect and that masks were not effective in preventing transmission. Well, how do you authenticate the source of where these things are coming from? Uh, so there's a lot of um, a lot of different uh, moving parts here, and uh, ultimately, David knows I would like to be part of a solution to create a global immune system for future pandemics, one that can integrate different disparate data sources. And by this, I don't just mean what looks like health data to you. I mean things like satellite data. I mean instrumenting the planet, the soil, the air, the water, every possible thing you can financial data, human migration data. And we need to be able to do this in a way where we don't feel like we're surveilling the planet at the same time. Uh, so with that, I'll um, pass it over to my colleague. Well, thank Thanks, you, Divya, and, and agree with you wholeheartedly. This is, we are definitely action oriented here. And so you have, you have presented the gauntlet for our salon participants. And, and I think I have a feeling that uh, um, Krista is going to even elevate that even more, given everything that you've been about focusing on impact, uh, both in your work in civil society in Canada, but also with companies around the world. So Krista, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, you're probably one of the most impact focused people that I know. And then what do you mm -hmm. think needs to be done when it comes to data privacy and the public interest? Perfect. Thanks so much, David. And thanks, Divya. Um, so I'm thrilled to be part of the conversation today. I, uh, as David mentioned, I've got a Kind of very background. I started in government and public policy and so I tend to bring a lot of things back into governance and government and looking at how that fits into the conversation. Um, I also worked for the largest loyalty company in the world which held a massive database of data and started really digging into data privacy and what people were willing to share for that extra couple of points for air, air miles and those types mm -hmm. of things. And for the past eight years have been working with the Digital ID and Authentication Council of Canada, really building a digital ID infrastructure and a validation infrastructure for Canadians. And the model that we've taken here in Canada is, is unique globally in that it came out of a partnership between the private and public sectors. So whereas in the US, you tend to have real leadership in, in privacy conversation really coming out of the private sector. So you have more Facebook and Google looking at identity questions. Um, out of the UK, you had the, the government say, we're going to hold a centralized view on identity. In Canada, we've said, really, if this is going to be interoperable and if it's going to put the citizen at the center, we need to have this collaboration between the public and private sector. And we need to look at privacy by design as a core component of any framework that we put forward. Now, we're fortunate here in Canada, we have Dr. Ann Kavukian, um, who is the, the mother of privacy by design. And I've had the privilege of working with her for a number of years on this work. And, and she will be the first to challenge that this does not need to be a zero sum between security and privacy, but that we need to look at 
this as an opportunity, A, for innovation, but also, again, to put citizens at the center of anything that we are doing. And so that's why I was really excited to be part of this conversation today and to be having the conversation with Accenture because of the opportunity that you have to help shape that conversation globally and, and what it could mean to really think about the user at the center of this, what does that experience look like? And thinking about how coming back, how governments are grappling with this. As, as we were preparing for this call, I noticed that um, New Zealand this week has come out with an intention and a statement that they are going to analyze all government algorithms and put a charter in place around privacy, which I think is incredibly mm -hmm. ambitious and laudable. I have no idea how they're going to actually be able to execute this. How do you this. do that? <laughs> um, I mean, this is huge. And the fact that they've put diversity at the core of this, and they, they really do have leaders on this. I think Dr. Tahu Kukatai out of uh, New Zealand is doing some absolutely brilliant work around indigenous inclusion um, in, in data ethics. So they've got some great tools, but that's huge. And I mean, here in Canada, we launched um, a digital uh, charter last year that put as a principle that citizens should be able to rely on the integrity and authenticity and security of the services that they use. Again, laudable. How are we going to do that? And what kind of data standards and infrastructure do we need to build? And what principles do we need to put in place to ensure that citizens can trust how data about them is being managed? So I will throw that out. Mm. Very well said. And, and, and because our data salons are meant to be interactive, I'm actually going to turn. Um, we have a colleague from Germany, uh, Sonja. I, I know you were talking about there is a debate going on right now in Germany about the, the privacy associated with the tracking app in Germany. I was wondering if you could maybe give us both a little bit of perspective and, and where you think we can make sure this is a non-zero-sum uh, activity. Well, there is, the, hello everybody, um, rather from, from the end of the day um, in Germany to you. Um, yeah, there has been a lot of discussion and German users tend to be very, very sensitive when it comes to data protection. Um, and the German government has developed in cooperation in its public-private partnership um, a tracking app for COVID and there has been a huge debate on privacy issues and they finally got to a point where um, they do not really share the data for scientific purposes. It's really just a tracking app that stores the data only on your mobile device and it has been tested by the Chaos Computer Club, so the Hacker Association in Germany, um, to have everybody from the civil society um, integrated in the development of data security questions, which might be an interesting um, option to, yeah, to balance the needs of scientific evaluation and the privacy issues and the abuse of, of data that is given away. Excellent. And I think that gives us really great, relevant, timely context on this. Uh, I, I know Anthony Scrippignano from Dun & Bradstreet joined us. I don't know if he's available because I actually wanted to turn to him because I know he's tackling some of these issues, but he may have had to step away. Anthony, if you're not there, I won't ask on you right away. All right, we'll circle back to you. Uh, but I, I think, Divya, uh, you know, sort of the challenges that Krista put forward and you actually put forward a gauntlet as well. You know, you've, you've talked a little bit about decentralization or what we could do to possibly like where you still retain your data, but maybe the algorithm comes to you and trains there. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, could you share a little bit about more about what you're doing and what your thoughts are there in that issue? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. So um, right now we have an internet architecture uh, which finds you and your computer and your data by its address tag, right? That's what TCP IP protocols are. Um, and TCP IP is not inherently safe. You need to put things like, just like you would have a security camera on your house, right? People know what your address is and you need to find another way of securing the property. Um, what if your data were not addressed by a tag that just says where it lives, but actually wrapped data as it was being generated within security wrappers. Um, and this set of protocols could live on top of your normal TCP IP pipeline. Uh, so we're actually, I, I co-found a company to actually try and do some of this work. And um, the idea is that we would encrypt data at rest and in motion. Um, and you would find it by making requests for that data based on naming protocols rather than based on simply addressing protocols. And this might, and of course, you know, it's a huge 
challenge. It's there are a lot of laudable goals out there, Krista, as you so well put it. But uh, you know, we're we're trying it at a smaller scale. But the idea would be is if this works, one could potentially uh, deploy systems like this in decentralized networks uh, in order to find data by its content rather than by its address tag. And in doing so, you also give the possibility of giving people back ownership of that data and a key is only given to a requester when they have a reasonable request and that entity or person who is the data source can choose whether or not they want to share it. The other issue you brought up, David, was uh, this idea of federated learning. Can we protect data by leaving it at the source and then training on it at the source rather than training on it centrally in aggregate? Uh, it, it turns out federated learning is a, is a is a nice solution, but it runs up against a lot of problems because in order to do federated learning properly, um, you have to deploy interesting solutions like adding lots of noise to the data right. where it resides so that you don't mistakenly identify it. Uh, if you can wrap data at rest and in motion, you potentially can gain your data insights in a central location if you have the correct key and then you don't get to hold on to it afterwards. So there, there are different approaches. One is a decentralized nodal network and the other piece of it is where do you do the, the data learning and, and uh, data action and insight generation. And, and thank you, Divya, for that. And I think that's actually a good key up for Anthony Scrippignano from Dun & Bradstreet. Glad you could join us, Anthony. I know you obviously face massive challenges with data, but also challenges where you need to obviously protect the data that Dun & Bradstreet has would be interested in your insights as to how you tackle that challenge there. Yeah, and I apologize. Ironically, I had a data privacy issue that I couldn't unmute myself when you were talking. <laughs> that um, so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about, there's, a, there's a, a salad bar approach here. It depends on what kind of data, of course. Tell me about this data of which you speak, right? Um, <laughs> You know, there are many countries in the world that have this concept of you need my permission every time you want to use my data. And we're looking at certain data millions of times a second. How do you do that? That's not possible. And no one wants to be asked millions of times a second, nor could they answer. Um, the idea of providing some sort of approach to federated learning is sort of juxtaposed to do we tag our data the same way? Do we agree in advance to certain ontologies? Uh, the problem that we face is on top of all of the statutory requirements, which are different all over the world in terms of data localization and cross-border data privacy and, you know, what data you can move and what data you can't, is that there are contractual obligations. So some of the, a lot of the data that we get, we promise not to share. We promise only to derive inference from it. It's not by law, it's by contract or by covenant. And so you layer that on top of it. Um, one of the things that I would say that will win every day is to have hybrid approaches. So we want, in a perfect world, we would all have longitudinal data and we would be able to do supervised machine learning on that and predict the future, which would be in a stable and unperturbed way. Well, none of that's true anymore, right? So it doesn't mean we just killed supervised learning, but it means that we need more hybrid approaches. And then when you start layering in these hybrid approaches, you do things like deal with missingness in data. Well, when you deal with missingness, you tend to fill it in with data that looks like the average, which means you can't do anomaly detection. So right. you have to stop and think about the unintended consequences of everything you're doing to solve a problem because there's a great expression, Arabic expression, be careful when you set out to flood a desert, you may succeed by draining an ocean, right? Everything you do has probably has some unintended consequences. Well, there's no binary here. Very well said, and I appreciate those insights. And I would say for everybody, I see there's, there is a healthy conversation going on in the chat. We want to make this interactive. And so if you have questions or things that you want to actually present, just say, I have something to add. Uh, and I, I know, um, David, uh, Scott, David, you've had some things. So, so maybe after I circle to Krista, I might circle to you, Scott, if you have some things to add as well. Krista, I know you've done a lot with digital identity. And, and, and in fact, Canada is really leading the way here. Um, would be interested in your thoughts about how do we reconcile data privacy with digital identity because the two are quite linked. Absolutely, they're hugely linked and it's it's been the conversation we've been having and, and one of the things that we've been heard a couple times here is things about my data versus data about me and I think that's another piece I'd love to dig in on a little bit more through this conversation but 
When we come into digital identity, we see this as really the core enabler of the digital economy and our whole digital ecosystem. And digital identity is A, about the person, but it's also about organizations or about things. So in Canada, we're even testing out being able to do provenance of some of our natural resources and tracking that and giving a digital identity to whether it be gas, but also food security, those kinds of questions. So digital identity we see as being core to a lot of this conversation. And what we're looking at is networks for identity. So we recognize that it is next to impossible for an individual to fully comprehend all of the data about them and how that might be used. So trying to create frameworks and trust frameworks. So we literally have what's called the Canadian, the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework that is in its version one um, iteration right now in Canada and being deployed where we've said, can we bring principles of interoperability to this framework that puts the citizen at the center and enables them to identify when information about them is being used, how it is being used, that they can share it with permission for that use case. And then they also have the ability to pull it back. And so we're using different models for that. Um, in some cases, it's a one-to-one -one verification. In other cases, we're actually using um, a broker model. So for us, when COVID hit and the federal government needed to get payments out to those who lost their jobs or to small businesses who wanted to keep um, employees paid, we've got a wage subsidy program that's working. I had the opportunity as a business owner to go in and use my bank as my verification tool. So I went to an intermediary and I said, I want to register with the Canadian Revenue Agency that I'm, I qualify for this. They said, okay, you can either request a code be mailed to you, it'll be to you in two weeks, and then we'll mail you a check, or you can go and you can, you can give permission for the revenue agency to check with your bank that you are who you say you are. And my bank has done all of the know your customer, they've done all the verification. They are able to then do that verification and all it is is a yes, no. At no point is my information, my banking information given to the government. That intermediary is really just a switch and it is, yes, is this Krista? Yes. Do you know and can you authenticate that she is associated to this account and that she has rights to that? Yes, great. That is then verified and I have access to my services. What that meant? We didn't get checks sent to dead people. Everybody had to authenticate and we were able to get the majority of our payments out to citizens. So the concrete impact of that, the mental health impact that that had was huge. That's one example of where digital ID comes and where you can actually put that privacy control in the hands of citizens in an informed way and getting away from these massive T's and C's that nobody could possibly understand. So I hope that gives one example, but I'd love to talk more with, with the group about that. Excellent. Thank you. Go ahead, Anthony. Uh, jump in. Um, yeah. Those two questions that you asked, are you who you claim to be and are you authorized to do what you propose to do? Also apply in the IoT. They also apply when mm -hmm. systems are talking to each other. Those are the universal questions of authentication and validation. If we keep that in mind when we design, we the world gets a lot better. So 100%. that's actually a good teeing up of what Krista said and what you just posed there, Anthony. I'm seeing in the chat some people said they wanted to talk about privacy engineering. So maybe I'm going to go to Divya first, Krista, and then open up to the group if anyone wants to add, which is if you got approached by, say, a CEO or, or a VC fund that said, we want to do the most, um, most, uh, the most uh, public focused effort with our privacy engineering, where we talk about both data data about people and data that people might have. Uh, would be interested, Divya, if you were being asked to design that, what principles would you want to bring into privacy engineering? Because I know some people have asked that. And I know uh, some other folks have also said, what do you do about folks that might not even understand the complexity of those decisions? I know Anthony said, you know, you don't understand, you, you assume the plane has brakes, but you're not one that's going to inspect those brakes. So what's the equivalent of breaks for data systems that actually are in the public interest. Yeah, I, I think some of it has been partially addressed by the comments that both Krista and Anthony made, but um, let me highlight a few of them. Um, so Anthony mentioned, and maybe I mentioned in my earlier opening remarks, uh, this principle of interoperability. Uh, it doesn't matter what status your data is, whether it's open and available exhaust versus um, data that you've actually pre-encrypted. If if it's not labeled in such a way that it can be understood according to standards and shared, uh, that data is worthless. So uh, 
I would say that one of the fundamental principles, and, and this is going to be a combination of privacy engineering and data engineering, is that data has to be labeled in a meaningful way and developing taxonomies for naming properly and finding international standards uh, where data can be understood, it becomes really important. Uh, the second piece of it is um, how can you both encrypt data and then um, share it in a way where the person who owns that data and who's generating that data can actually not answer Anthony every single request because that would become absurd, but perhaps can answer some general principles whereby they would like to share and contribute their data for certain kinds of public good, but maybe don't want to share their data for say the sake of uh, some company X's advertising dollars, right? or to be targeted, for instance, for political campaigns, um, very similar to the Facebook uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal. And you could create a system not only of encrypting the data, but also of having sort of a, something very similar to what we do in academia, which is having an IRB, an institutional review board, whereby if you're a scientist or a clinician and you want to use data and make sense of it, uh, you actually have to say what you're going to do with that data, how you're going to use it, how you're going to protect it, and then you make the request. And if that request is granted, then only then and only then do you get access to that data and only for the purpose for which you, you specified. You can have a reciprocal process whereby the people who are creating the data say that I have certain principles. This is like my own IRB. And these are the things that I will contribute my data to. And anytime a request meets my standards, then that data can be shared and a key can be given to, to decrypt. Um, the final piece of it is something that everybody's been touching on, which is how do you actually authenticate the source? And there are ways in which you can, and there are multiple ways to do this, but sort of these federated identity management systems whereby you can actually, even in decentralized networks, authenticate what kind of data is coming in. And you can do so in a way where you take the person who's generating the data and the things that identify them personally and take them out of it so that that system can be automated uh, and thereby you can preserve privacy. So there are multiple approaches to doing this. Very well said, Divya. And, and so Chris, I'm gonna ask you the same question with a slightly different tweak. Assume a, an investor fund came to you and said, we wanna do the first data co-op between Europe, Canada, and the United States to make it even more complicated. Uh, what would you what would you recommend as principles to consider with privacy engineering that 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 uh, that could actually make sure that we're as as, as public focused as possible mm -hmm. in that, that endeavor? I mean, I, the reality is that's not a hypothetical. We've had people come with that question, and the first place I go is standards. And uh, we've all talked about interoperability. I think getting to that standard set and getting out of these unique solutions developed for unique snowflake cases does not work in data. Um, if we want to be able to try to get into that, that truly global solution, we need to recognize that standards are going to be key, that there isn't going to be one solution that works in all geographies, but that standards is going to create that interoperability piece. And I think that's, that's really critical. I, I listened to what Divya said about the federated identity pieces. And again, it's one of those that I, I love in principle. Um, and I'll give Dr. K uh, Kukatai credit for this one. We were, we've been talking about wastewater evaluation for disease identification. And she said, you know, that's, that's a, a practice that we see happening globally, but there's an inherent bias in that, that we need to be conscious of. It's great if you're talking a municipality like Toronto, that is fairly anonymized. If you start to go into indigenous communities where you have a concentrated population of a specific demographic, you're not actually ensuring privacy. In fact, you're likely going to be stigmatizing. So we need to recognize that some of our assumptions around mass data anonymity are not true. And so I, I get concerned anytime I start to hear these solutions that don't necessarily consider the broader implications. Um, so that's, that would be a big flag I'd put around fed, federated identities. I also saw coming through the question um, spaces, a question around that data control and trust. And I think that that's a fundamental piece that I would build into if we were building this kind of an infrastructure is there has to be that ability to take, um, to pull your data back. 
And I know, and this may be an opportunity, Stuart, I'm going to ask us to throw up a question because I, I had one that I, I think is relevant right now. Um, so the, the question on, on privacy and privilege, Stuart, I'd love to get a sense from the group on this. All right, sure. Stuart's going to okay. throw up the question while he's doing that. I was actually, while he's putting up the question, so this is a question for everybody. Do you think people should own data about themselves? And so we'll play the Jeopardy theme music in the background. You can mentally, since it's probably copyrighted, I can't actually play it, but imagine it in your heads. Uh, place your votes. Um, and who phrased this? <laughs> who phrased this? The only no, that's the only no objection we can possibly have. <laughs> so actually that's a good tea. I was gonna turn to you, Andrew, maybe while we, we, we get people's results. So 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 Andrew Mack, would you be interested in sharing a little bit about what you're doing and then what you're thinking about also with farmers and, and how we make sure Sure. Uh, sure. And thanks thanks, David. Um the so uh, I'm the CEO of a startup called Agromobile. We're actually past the startup point at this stage. Um, we, we, we're a farm to market platform working with small farmers, transporters, and, uh, and buyers in various parts of the world. And um, this is an issue that's come up a lot, uh, but in a, in a slightly different way than the way that it's being framed right now, uh, for a bunch of reasons. Number one is because a lot of the people that we're dealing with are much newer to the internet, much newer to seeing themselves as data hubs, seeing themselves as owners of data, and also because we're trying very, very hard to be, to the greatest extent possible, pro-farmer in everything that we do, right? And so there's, there's a risk that you face because on the one hand, you want to get the tool out in people's hands. That's already new enough, right? And then you, which you, the last thing you want to do is to get them confused by or to get wrapped around the axle around things that are, you know, that are kind of amorphous, Right, that, that, that feel very much like amorphous rights. And so, and so what we're trying as much as we can to be a global platform. We were currently working in, in, in Colombia. We just got uh, um, a big uh, 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 USDA um, thing to do a, an, uh, an, uh, um, a rollout in Tanzania. So we're very excited about that. And this is an issue that's definitely going to come up how not only how do you choose to use data but also how do you communicate that use and how do you do it in a way to meet people where they are uh i don't think it's rational to expect that everyone is going to have the same level of experience nor frankly that it's going to be an easy conversation so we'd be very much interested in knowing what people think about it um most of our, the data that we're going to be collecting is about production and about you know the size of transactions and things like that. It's not personal data in a in a in like in a medical sense, um, but we want to be as open as we possibly can while using that data to help make the supply chain better. And that that's a fascinating sort of again, like you said, it's not it's not specific to a person, but it could be revealing, and you want to do it with the appropriate sensitivity. And maybe one step is, is actually think about, and like you said, I mean, the farmers are busy, they, they already have busy schedules, but are there a few community leaders that could be involved in anything you do or something? Well, like it's also about, you, I think that the thing is, for a lot of these new technologies, as you're going out, especially into the rural areas that are newer to the whole, that, that feel newer to the whole data game, I mean, a lot of the places that we're gonna be working aren't even on Google Maps, right? They're, the roads that get there aren't, aren't even on Google Maps. so. So, so the question is, how do, you, how do you be respectful of people's data without taking the conversation to a place that doesn't really make a lot of sense and doesn't feel connected to their day-to-day? -day? Very well said. And maybe I'll go to Krista, because I know when you were asking that question we had in the green room, we, 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 we had some of what was in the chat, which is we thought own was a very loaded term. It actually probably isn't the right verb for the error in, but maybe if you could really quick give us your thoughts there because I think other people in the chat have also uh, keyed in that own might not be the right verb that we want to mm -hmm. use there. Yeah, and, and we, we intend to put that in to be provocative because I would agree own doesn't exist. The reality is data about me is often not controlled by me. And so being aware of that, it's more how do we want to have principles around data use? And, and again, it's, it's that consent and ability to control it. And, and it is proportionate. It's recognizing what is heavily identified and very personal 
versus the information of the bank has a video of you walking into the branch. And yes, that's data about you because they have your likeness, but you haven't controlled it. You, you've effectively by walking into that branch consented it being, um, it being gathered. So recognizing, and I think there was a question in, in here, a comment about that we assume that data is being created. I think we have to. Um, I, I think that, that that's, that's something we have to assume is out there. It's just going to be, how is it going to be used? And I really would suggest we need to move away from any concept of it being my data, because that, that's just, again, not a reality of the world in which we operate. Very, very provocative thoughts and very appreciative of you sharing them, Krista. I'm going to go to Scott David because I know you've had some thoughts and then I'm going to go to Bryce and then I think I'm going to Anthony because I saw there were hands being raised. So maybe Scott David, I know you've had some thoughts here. And I think you need that. You know, it's funny. It's funny. <laughs> I was just really recording what I was hearing, which was so fascinating. Really great conversation. One of the things that I've been fussing with a little bit is, and, and, and David and I have been in these conversations in other contexts, um, you know, I, I'm trying to understand, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade, so I'm trying to understand things like information theory and things like that. And one of the things I've come to understand in this space is that we historically had used data as a surrogate for privacy, right? So uh, G, G, GDPR, there's a great article by Bob Gelman, G-E-L-L-M-A-N, and it's called something like a brief history of fair information practice principles or practice principles, a brief history, very good short paper. And what it does is it traces the origin of fair information practice principles. And it goes back to a time when data really didn't move around. It wasn't networked. Now it's networked. And we then when it wasn't moving around, we kind of said, okay, if the data is not moving around, then we got privacy by default. Now it moves around a lot and we're still focusing on the data. And that it, it, data is necessary, data security is necessary, but not sufficient for privacy. What we need now, and, and what I'm advocating for indirectly in those comments is meaning security. And that's narrative. And so a lot of what's happening now politically, economically, is the data is flying around, there's good data, bad data, whatever, there's so much data, sort of flooded data, there's such an exponential increase in interaction volumes, which follows the Moore's laws in, as a result of Moore's law, that we have a lot of blank space. And so in that blank space, all of our institutions were formed for earlier inst interaction volumes. And now we have all this blank space where the institutions are not fit for function for giving us narrative for what's going on in that blank space. So we have lots of data, lots more interactions, and we don't have the narratives that are sufficiently robust to, to cover, to cover complex systems, to cover these things. So we're focusing on data because that's what the law says, that GDPR, it's really kind of antiquated. And, it, uh, and, I'll, and I'll take two more comments and I'll stop talking. It's, it's so, I'm so enthusiastic about the issue. There's a great paper, which is very thought provoking uh, by the OECD back in like 2007, 2009 called Personhood. Take a look at it. Because what it argues is that in Europe, what we have is the idea of identity, which is all bound up in this data security. And it's hard for us to just think of data of about inventory, we think about humans all the time, um, that in, the EU, in Europe, it's bound up in Hegelian notions of connection with a person and the output. It's kind of like, for those of you who are lawyers or live in Europe, their moral rights, like drope morale, where if I paint a painting and I sell it to David, he can't destroy it. He can't burn it in Europe. He has moral, excuse me, I have moral rights as an artist. In the US, if I sell you a painting, you can do anything you want with it. Mm. It's, it's in the stream of commerce. In Europe, I get the sense and there's no direct authority to this, but that we treat data as if it's a form of expression from the person and that there's some strings and rights associated with it. That paper makes the point that in the US, it's Locke and the utilitarians that kind of are at the base, and not just them, but the spirit, the gestalt of them, is at the base of how we treat personhood. And as a result, when data is out in the US, it's in the stream of commerce. And so we, very, we don't have strings very often. And so part of what we're dealing with is philos uh, philosophy as commodity. Data is, is com commoditized philosophy in a sense, which means that in some ways they're incommensurable. And what that, when you have incommensurables, rhetoric, narrative is what glues incommensurables together. That's it. There's, a, there's actually a book I have on the shelf called Rhetoric and Incommensurability, right? So as lawyers, 
and as philosophers and as storytellers and as folklorists and as policymakers, that's what we do is we glue stuff together that doesn't fit together. And it feels like right now we have this opportunity, not just in Europe versus the US, not just interculturally, but interjurisdictional, inter um, sectorally. So one of the things, last point, one of the things I've done is I started to say something has to be technically, and this is for AI stuff and everything we're doing, it has to be technically feasible and bolts reasonable. And that's yeah. business, operating, legal, technical, and social. So if something's technically feasible and bolts reasonable, then you start to tick through, okay, what's the social things? Well, it's privacy and psychology. Da -da. Operating, is it really going to work? Da -da -da. So it just gives us uh, some parity of analysis because we focus so much on data as if it's the be all and end all. And the reality is we're going to find that data is really about risk is what we've been talking about allocating. And when we're allocating risk, we, we can do that. That's what lawyers do. That's what engineers do when they're creating requirements. We're balancing these things. So we need to balance within and among the bolts columns is the analysis at least I've been doing. So I'll stop there. Sorry for the. Oh, that was very no, good. We missed. appreciate it. Um, Divya, I was going to go real quick because I know you were smiling when he was giving some of his comments for a quick rejoinder. And then I'm going to go to Bryce, then to Anthony, and to Krista. And I think I may also have Sanja and Bob Corley too. So Divya, you're up. Well, well, there's been so much really good and interesting stuff said. Um, I actually, I want to touch on what Christopher said and then move that to what Scott was saying. But, you know, when we talk about, well, Krista, when you were challenging this no notion of data ownership, there is data that is produced. There is data that is sort of passively produced. Like for instance, like the example you gave, you walk into a bank and you're captured on that camera. Um, or I go to, <laughs> I go to the market, David, and I buy garlic, right? And suddenly I clean out the market, right? So there, are, there's data that is kind of produced that way. But I'm gonna go back to my hat as a physician what about what if i were to take every single one of us and just turn you into a bunch of bits right so i'm going to digitize you i'm going to digitize your genome i'm going to digitize your neural code uh do you still feel the same way as what krista said do you actually own the data that is you that comprises you if i were to take you and turn you into a, a digital facsimile of yourself now do you have data ownership over that is that a clean line for you or is that also a fuzzy line? Is there no such thing? I don't even get to own myself. If you read my brain waves and create a brain print about me, or if you read my genome and discover who I am, do I also sort of sign off the rights to that as well? And I think that that's an, an important conversation because data that is literally our personhood, Scott, versus data that is left behind is exhaust. I think that those are two very different kinds of data and we may want to consider treating that differently. Here's another thing. I could potentially change my exhaust. I can't change who I am. And so if you're going to take my data about my genome, for instance, and use that against me and leverage it against me, I'm done. I'm absolutely done. And so you actually have to ask about the potency of that data and its meaning in the world. And so for me, these are, we're actually talking about different kinds of data. And again, I'm going back to personhood. Um, I was, I, I like the way you said that, Scott. And just as, as art I might produce, maybe part of my personhood, I, my line is I would argue that my DNA and my brain waves and all of these other pieces of my biometry are also part of my personhood. Wow, that, that's, uh, <laughs> we could easily do another data salon on that. So I think you, you definitely gave us some really good questions as well as some good thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm about to go to Anthony, but real quick, uh, there's a lot going on in the chat. And if anyone wants us to not use what you said publicly in the chat, we won't use any of the private comments. Please let us know. We will redact your name. So it'll be Chatham House. So it'll be, here's what was discussed, but we will remove people's names and we will share it with uh, the invite list here. But if anyone in particular wants anything removed, you can let us know both now or later, but it seems like there's a lot of valuable conversation in this chat, which would be a shame to lose. I just want to present that to people. Um, Anthony, I know you have to deal with both the philosophy of this, but also making it real on a daily basis. How do you do this without your head exploding? Um, give us some, some sort of guideposts um, to actually make this real. Our Chatham House rules, alcohol helps. Um, <laughs> all, right. uh, all kidding aside, um, first of all, you know, I, I have, I'm sitting here having a moment, right, thinking what, 
what a, an amazing group of um, incredible minds you brought together and how generous everyone's being. When, when Scott was talking, I took two pages of notes, right? Um, and, you know, it's um, the, the practical, right? The how. Um, I want to go back to this analogy of walking into the bank and taking a video, right? We assume, and I, th I forget exactly, uh, Crystal, what you said, but something like we, we give our consent to that by walking into the bank. I assume that the bank is taking videos so that if I'm kidnapped, the police will know what the guy that kidnapped me looked like and go help me, right? Um, or if somebody robs the bank, then it will be used to find them. So we always assume these things that are good for us happening, right? Uh, but realistically, we're all on a, a Zoom conference right now. We're, many of us are on video and some of us know enough to take a screenshot and develop an eigenface and connect that to other photos and find your other name that you use or the other communities that you're in where you're not identified the same way. The unintended use of the casual sharing of data is out of control. What we, several people have mentioned, the Cambridge Analytica thing, it wasn't really a um, you know, it was it was just an under, a creepy use of data that was kind of consistent with what happened when you clicked I agree. So I would I would as much as I can scream from the top of the mountain until somebody pushes me off, is we should always stop and think about the unintended use of what we think is benign that we're doing at, at any given moment. This concept of the digital me, we all have a digital me, right? And it doesn't have to be like a digital twin of the human being and the human genome, although that's amazing. And I know those things are going on. It could be as simple as your device fingerprint. And I saw you again, and I know what you did last time. And maybe you don't realize that I know that. Um, right now, it's all pretty naive. I buy shoes and then I get a bunch of ads trying to sell me shoes. I already bought shoes, right? Um, maybe you should try to sell me socks, but it's getting smart. <laughs> uh, it's getting a lot smarter and it's getting smart at a rate that's out of control. So the one thing I would say, David, that one way that I keep my sanity is to be as Socratic as possible. Where am I trying to go? Why am I trying to get there? What do I have to believe in order to take this journey? It, this is not about technology. This is about problem formulation and epistemology and some of the things that Bryce was talking about. It's, this is not a technology thing. No, it's exactly, like I said, it's sense making. How do you make sense of the world? Yeah. And how do you know the questions you're asking are yeah. the right ones? Amen. All right, so I'm about to go to Sanja, then Bob, and then I'm going to Krista and Divya, although I also saw that Bob, Bob Gorley has changed himself to say I am also Anthony Scrippignano, so he, he's, he's demonstrating how easy it is. Um, but I'm going to go to Sanja in a minute. But I would also say this has been a, we're going to continue as long as people want to stay. I want to respect the fact that some people may have to drop off at the hour. But I will also say for anyone who wants to have deeper conversations on this or put together a white paper or a blog post or something like on that, the invitation is open to you all. You have Stuart Scott, who's helped with all the coordination here's email. You can email us. We are here to provide a sounding board and a platform for all these conversations because these are things that policymakers need to hear, but also CEOs of companies. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn to Sanja. I know you've got some insights here, uh, both from a German and European perspective than Bob and then Chris and Divya for the closing. Well, it's less an insight, more a question. Something we are discussing here is if you try to establish something like a, yeah, maybe the Canadian way, a trusted uh, space in the internet where you say, um, when you share your data that way, if you cooperate with um, big companies, and here is also this question of power, they have to sign up to certain rules. Um, and you make a choice if you use it the protected or the unprotected way. Um, I'm not sure where this is leading to, and we all know it's a very complex system, but um, to me the idea was, or the thought and the debate is somewhat intriguing to build on publication laws and to, um, yeah, to give the responsibility back to those who publish and who transfer data and inf make information from it. That is, and, and actually to build on what you said, Sandra, recognizing there's some, that, that, that easily could be another day's line. Uh, I want to give a call out to uh, Tiffany Vora, who pointed out related to that, when we think about genomic information, there have been two high profile lawsuits in which doctors have been sued for handling genomic info that impacted relatives. And so it's recognizing that even data that we think is about us may also be about other people as well, right down to our DNA. So, so we may need an entirely new 
new sense making philosophy, much like how Bryce was saying, maybe we need to look to narratives that are beyond just what's going on in the US with the sense of privacy and talk about power, but also think about linkages as well. Uh, Bob, I know you have, you have a lot of a sense as to how uh, people can do bad things to others and, and what you can do to prevent that. Uh, Bob, be interested in your thoughts before we go to Kristen and, and Divya for the closing. All right, I'll try to be brief. I want to say that there's some very significant threats to privacy, and sometimes it's not where we're thinking they're from. Um, for example, journalists lately have been outing people, doxing people who were trying to use a pen name to publish online, um, and there's some very high-profile cases. One, a New York Times reporter, um, um, uh, Kade Metz, um, outed a journalist, an a individual, private citizen, using a pen name, uh, uh, Scott Armstrong, who was writing a non diplomed blog, very populous, popular in Silicon Valley. And he didn't want to be outed. And he kept telling this journalist, please don't do this. Uh, it's a threat to my family and my livelihood. He's also a doctor. Uh, but the journalist did it anyway. And there's example after example after example of this. And, you know, it's part of our culture uh, in the U.S. anyway to be able to write things under a non de plume and stay anonymous or pseudonymous and and I believe we should continue to support that culture and let people do that when they need to and that's another thing that if you're doing that you need to protect it perhaps for decades you want to keep your non de plume you know private and it's there's some serious threats to that in the digital age and I think we need to come to grips with that and then I also mentioned that's part of our culture, and just to state the obvious, since we are the Geotech Center, uh, not all geographies have cultures that share the same views on things like data. And it's very interesting to think through that um, also. And that brings to mind the uh, 16 July uh, EU ruling about uh, data sharing between uh, mm -hmm. EU and the US, which is gonna have significant impacts on how US companies do business with Europe and vice versa. And because we have different views on protecting information of our citizens. Well said, and I know, Krista, you've had some things to add on the conversations here. Uh, both you and Divya have succeeded beyond our wildest dreams with a lively conversation. Uh, Krista, uh, I, I'm open to your thoughts as we try to bring this all back together again. Sure, just a couple of quick ones. Um, I totally agree with Bryce on the need to think beyond the individual. Uh, I know I mentioned Dr. Fukutai earlier, but there's a really strong concept in Maori culture around hereditary identity and that you don't actually, there's a responsibility on you not to share information because it doesn't belong solely to you. So coming back to Divya's question of, do I own my own um, medical information? That thesis would say no, that because there is ident identifying information about others beyond you and about that community, that it actually extends beyond. So there are implications of that. And I, I loved Tiffany's point. I, again, we could go on a long time about that. I did a survey a couple of years ago working for a loyalty company where we, we surveyed what people were willing to share in 16 different geographies. I will say the US is on the extreme. They will share pretty much anything for extra points. Germany <laughs> will share next to nothing <laughs> for extra points. Um, so I think it's a really important piece to recognize, especially as we're moving towards this global environment. And that's why I really was, was focusing on standards and interoperability is we do need to recognize that there are not global norms around what privacy is, what security is. If you talk to an Israeli around security and privacy, they are willing to give away a lot for a sense of communal security. In Canada, we tend to skew heavily into the individual privacy. And I don't know, it's not that one is right or wrong, it's recognizing there are different geographic realities. So trying to solve this with a single definition of what privacy is or how data should be managed, I, I truly believe is a fool's errand. What we need to figure out are what are appropriate governance structures that enable interoperability of data within norms that are acceptable to individuals in, and I don't even wanna say individual nations, because I think that becomes too, to binding, but to individuals and communities and how they want to operate. And I'm not pretending that that is an easy solve, but I think some of those core principles, and I've shared a couple of documents up, not that I think they're the right solutions, but at least they're a starting point of conversation to think about what that might look like. Well, so, you know, I'll, I'll go as, a, as a hierarchy or as a tier, it makes me wonder if this is something that kind of leapfrogs that, that modality, right? We have a, 
we, we've had this kind of tiered system that gets to an individual, but what we're seeing with current systems is that we can maybe do away with some of that government oversight and be direct to the people. Um, and does that kind of color your comments at all as well? For me, yes. And I see somebody here mentioning um, Microsoft. I would say also look at Kim Cameron's work. He's the Microsoft identity architect for a number of years. He's been doing some work recently on the difference between who-ness and whatness. And I think it gets to your point, Stephen, of, of do we start to look at different models of what we consider both identity and, and the data uses? And again, I'd encourage some exploration of that work. Well, so I'm also going to present, since, uh, since we, we, we've already extended the invitation, if folks want to continue the, the conversations or engagements here, I will say with the Geotech Center, we have, I won't name the name of the large institutional foundation, but it's a large institutional foundation that's asking questions about data governance and what can be done. And, and I think we're, we're really probably at the point where we've just got to sort of learn by doing. I mean, we have a lot of great ideas. There's no shortage of ideas as to what could be done. But I do present to the entire group, if you have thoughts about a possible project that we could turn to that large institution and say, here's how we could go about and learn by doing. I know, Andrew, you, you mentioned part of what you're doing with farmers. That might be one, but there may be others as well. Um, and, and sort of building on Stephen's comment, if we're waiting for governments to get this, uh, we might be waiting a very long time and we're probably not going to be happy with the initial <laughs> iteration. And so if we want to bring positive change in this space, we've got to be leaning forward and probably finding a combination of local need with one or more industry partners that want to do something beyond business as usual, but actually do something. And so I put that out there as a group because I think, Krista, you really build upon it, which is we've got a lot of things that we can do. Uh, what, what, what's the first impact that we want to do and, and sort of learn from doing from them. Uh, Divya, do you have uh, closing thoughts? Uh, I, and I also do want to give a shout out to uh, Scott David's Bolt framework. I think that's a very, uh, that's a very powerful framework to think about. Um, Divya, you get to have the closing rejoinder. Well, it's interesting. I feel like we started this conversation in one place um, talking about public and private trade-offs. And we've ended up in a very different place, so maybe not very different, but I think that people are asking important questions about uh, data ownership, whether the data that we think is you, whether the data that we produce actually has any ownership rights. Uh, I, by the way, both Krista and Bryce do not disagree at all. Um, in fact, uh, one of the reasons I have not have given my data to companies, I had this conversation with you, Stephen, to places like 23andMe, is even if they purport to operate by ethical standards, my parents didn't give consent for me to give my data away. So I'm, I'm very, um, I'm actually very aware of the fact that a lot of my data is, is somewhat inherited and it's part of community, right? So if I give away my whereabouts, uh, I reveal, so, or, you know, this has been used against people, right? Um, my social contacts that could determine the loan worthiness of a friend of mine on social media or something like this. So we don't exist in isolation, but I feel like for the sake of being practical, we also, much as I want to be philosophical about this, do have to think about whether there are certain lines that we draw in the sand. And I would still argue to you that if you want <laughs> I would still guard my DNA and my neural data in a way that I don't feel as if I would be guarding, for instance, the exhaust that I leave behind. But that being said, I feel like this conversation has turned on a really important point, and it's really all about the ethical use and governance of data. Uh, Bryce made a comment about power being perhaps the more interesting piece of this. And in fact, if there weren't power asymmetries, probably none of us would be all that concerned <laughs> about these pieces of our data being shared. And it's simply because those asymmetries exist that we have to be so concerned. And so much as I agree with you, Bryce, I don't see that being eliminated anytime soon. And so I still think that this, this conversation that we're having about data protection, data governance, and the ethical use of data is important because I think that humans and animals actually are inherently hierarchical. And wherever they can get leverage and score points, they're probably going to do so. And if that is by by reading my brainwaves, then yes, that will be used against me. So um, 
yeah, on that on that note. <laughs> All right. Maybe I can now sort of end on a happy note. If you could give us, Divya and then Krista, two to three tweet length answers as to if you wanted to continue, because there's been a lot of great sharing, a lot of great conversations here, what would be two or three tweet links next steps that you'd want to do to 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 make sure that that this conversation doesn't happen in isolation, but it moves forward somewhere? Divya? Oh, we're starting with me. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that um, when you share information, um, just consider uh, where it may be going, who it may be shared with, and what the unintended consequences are. Um, and when you use other people's data and market, um, use the golden rule and think about how you would want to be treated if that were your own data. And if we use those principles, I think that we're much more likely to, to protect others. Well said, and I'm going to pull two comments that also that sort of build on what you just shared, Divya. Um, I think first Tiffany Vora said she feels differently about personalized ads versus personalized medicine. I think that's something that we need to recognize that context shapes where, what mm -hmm. people are willing to do. And then Scott also said, um, Scott David said, power is everything in existential context, which again, I think also amplifies what you said as well, Divya. All right, Krista, you get to bring it home with two or three uh, tweet length actionable okay. steps. What would you recommend? So actionable steps for me, um, it's reach out to others in this community and beyond to start to look at what are those principles. I think it's going to rely upon thoughtful leaders like those who are gathered here to have that conversation and to push governments. Um, I don't look at the government of Myanmar thinking that they're going to give great identity solutions to Rohingya Muslims. So the reality of nation, looking to nation states to create the models I think is gone and it now is incumbent upon the rest of us to step up and take that leadership. So I'll, I'll borrow David's be bold um, statement for that. I would push back as well against, and I think people on this call get it, but recognizing that anytime something feels like it's too good or you're getting too much, question how that data is being used and, and use your inquisition to the good of others. Because one of the things we haven't talked about here is there is a privilege that comes in being part of this conversation. And the reality is that many people who are using these technologies do not have the privilege of asking the questions and I think it is incumbent on a lot of us not to to be a bit the the malevolent the benevolent dictator and to push back against some of the technologies and some of the behaviors that we're seeing and speak up when we see things that aren't right so that would be my calls to action well said be bold be brave be benevolent um, and that we need to come together again I will extend to everybody here um, and, and anyone who else that you would like to engage we do have a geotech commission that is looking for actual steps that we can recommend, mm -hmm. uh, not just the United States, but to the world as a whole. And welcome all your thoughts. Again, I wanna give a heartfelt thanks both to uh, Stephen and everyone at Accenture for sponsoring this conversation and to Krista and Divya. You, you truly had a, this is probably the most interactive uh, mm -hmm. virtual data salon that we've had so far, so thank you. Yes, thank you all. Thanks everyone. And yes, we will get a community page and an email list up for more interaction with people uh, that was asked. We'll make sure that gets done. All right. See everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.